from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell in Adelaide, back in the city after a bit of a visit to the Limestone Coast, which is the southeastern region of South Australia. So some amazing beaches and then a short drive inland to the Kunawara, which is a fantastic wine region, a strip of red soil, terra rossa soil atop limestone, which means wonderful vines and even more wonderful wines are produced there. But a lot happened in the cricket world while I was away. I kept finding oddments of signal to see that England's women had managed to not win a single game in the Ashes. Australia's women absolutely won that series outright. And then all manner of news which we'll be discussing in the show, also surrounding England and Australia's men's teams. Hi, it's Jim Maxwell in Sydney, and I'm looking out the window and I can see a rainbow, but the end of the rainbow, I'm sorry, Ali, I see Meg Lanning, Elise Perry, <laughs> Alyssa Healy. Um, it's all gold, 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 gold everywhere. It's, it's been the golden summer for Australian cricket. And uh, what's going to happen next? Pakistan coming up. Sheffield Shield starting. Uh, oh, and a bit of T20 against uh, Sri Lanka. So life goes on very happily. Well, one part of the world is certainly going to believe that blue comes before gold, Jim. This is Charu Sharma for <laughs> All India Radio. Um, returning from the Kapi Estate in Coorg, where, of course, there's a lot of picking going on. It's picking season, but I couldn't reach Bangalore in time. So I've stopped halfway, which is in the royal city of Mysore. Got myself a hotel room, pulled the curtains uh, together, and here we go. Um, Seems like all is forgiven and forgotten for Indian cricket. Were they really in South Africa a short while back? Well, anyway, the under-19 team has won the World Cup for the fifth time in a row, so it's obviously robust, the system in India. And at home, as always, the Indian team can't seem to do any wrong, particularly against the hapless West Indies. Yeah, big congratulations to the Indian under-19s. That does bode well for the future, doesn't it, with that strength in depth and youngsters coming through. We are going to start this week, though, on the show by talking about the aftermath of the shock resignation of Australian men's head coach Justin Langer. Now, just to remind everybody, you'll remember that Langer was brought in at a time of real crisis for the Australian men's team. It was after the Sandpapergate scandal in 2018. Well, now he's left his role after a season in which Australia have won both the T20 World Cup and the Ashes. Now, his contract wasn't yet up, but discussions were due on its renewal or otherwise, and his future had been the subject of a lot of speculation. It was believed Langer wanted to continue, so why did he leave? Well, in his resignation letter to Cricket Australia's chief executive, Nick Hockley, he said, quotes, I was offered a short-term contract until the end of the T20 World Cup in Australia, with the sentiments of going out on a high. After careful consideration, he says, I've decided not to accept this contract renewal. He goes on to say, if media reports are correct, several senior players and a couple of support staff don't support me moving forward. And it is now apparent the CA board and UNIC are also keen to see the team move in another direction. He says, my life has been built on values of honesty, respect, trust, truth and performance. And if that comes across as too intense, at times, I apologise. So that was part of Langer's uh, resignation letter, which was published in Australian media. So it's quite a bit to unpack there, isn't there? Langer only offered a six-month contract extension. The reports of the discord between players and coach and an apology from Langer for his apparent intensity. New captain Pat Cummins then eventually spoke and clarified his own position including feedback that he and other senior players gave to the board. Jim, how, first of all, did the simple matter of a coach's contract become such a convoluted and emotive affair as well? And what did you make of CA offering just a six-month deal to Justin Langer? Well, it, it, it was a, a bit of a, a flaky cake in the wind, really. Uh, I mean, if they'd been brutal, as many organisations are, when they've made their mind up to go in another direction, they should have just said, thanks, Justin. Terrific. Uh, we're moving on. But Pat Cummins is obviously the man in charge, a very, as you suggested, a clear thinker. Uh, he has a lot of intelligence and emotional intelligence. In fact, he's got more emotional intelligence than some of the former players who've been going on with a lot of claptrap about what should be going on with the treatment of Langer. We all know in life, in politics, in business and in sport, Sometimes associations come to an end and it can be quite brutal. How do you handle it comfortably? It, it's not very easy. So uh, I think uh, 
Cummins has handled himself extremely well. Uh, so has Langer. He's gone out with um, a fair bit of respect. So change in the wind. But Pat Cummins, as has always been the case in Australian cricket, is the man in charge. It's the captain in charge, not the coach. What happened to the good old-fashioned concept of communication? I mean, you talk to the man who's been leading Australia as their head coach for the last four years with obvious success. Surely he can't be saying, I've read in the media and some people are saying this and, you know, what's going on here? I mean, I think the cricket board, the chief, the selectors, whoever need to sit with Langer and have a long conversation. So you've done four years, hope you enjoyed it. The team's done really well. And what makes sense, therefore, is to talk to him about whether you'd like to continue for another one, two, four. What's your priority? Because we obviously are fond of you. You've done well. But whose opinion do you really take? Who are the selectors of the head coach? Is it the team? Is it the captain? Is it some other people? So this is a, a jumble that hasn't worked very well for Langer at all. He has to admit that it's their right to hire and fire. But to get somebody with obvious success for only a six-month extension, that's rude. Because, I mean, what are you trying to prove? If there's somebody who's, who's interning for the job, you can say, we'll give it to you for six months and then we'll see. You've done a really good job for four months and now we're going to see what you're going to do in the next six months. It doesn't work. Well, let's bring in our guest, someone who will have a lot of insight on uh, player coach, captain coach dynamics even and what it takes to be a successful coach of an international team. The former Australian men's coach, John Buchanan, is with us. John, of course, had a lot of success with the national side, coaching Australia to two World Cups, multiple Ashes wins and that run of 16 consecutive test match victories. John, welcome to Stumps. How are you coached Justin Langer? Um, you've been critical of Cricket Australia's treatments of him. What did you make of what Pat Cummins has had to say since? Firstly, I suppose, I'll, as you said, I'll underpin this one because I am a fan of Justin, obviously, having been associated with him as a player and then as a friend and, and the person himself. I mean, I haven't seen his so-called coaching style, um, but I could understand that he is a person who demands excellence of himself and therefore of people around him. And if uh, he or they don't live up to it, then he's going to come down hard on that. And I noticed in Pat Cummins' comments, um, you know, some of the words that he chose, one was he said that we've been very well schooled by Justin Langer, uh, which to me gives a, a sense of, well, there was a the headmaster and we were the pupils. And, and that was the, uh, that was kind of the culture that, that operated. And as he said, you know, we now want a, a calmer, more collaborative uh, coach. Again, I'm not sure exactly what that will mean, because again, if we understand what coaching is about and that's where I think there's a bit of a gap in the system that I don't think Cricket Australia or you were just talking sure about um, India I don't think a lot of uh, associations really understand the role of the coach yes <clears throat> no doubt the captain runs the show uh, on the field but to get from field to field from tournament to tournament from year to year and try to sustain success that's not the captain's role uh, the captain's role is to captain a, a group of players and play himself uh, and try to perform from game to game. But the overall planning, the strategy, the culture, um, the behaviours, all that sort of stuff really falls fairly and squarely on the, on the coach. Um, and so Langer, who came in four years ago, was given that task, change the culture, get the Australian team to be a bit more likeable and win some games. <laughs> He's ticked those boxes. So at the moment, people are... You know, I don't think really understand what that role is. And, and certainly then when you add to that um, other words, like we're in transition and we're evolving, again, that is a bit of gobbledygook. It's a bit of smokescreen stuff for me. I mean, now that um, Langer, who was supposedly given the six months transition period, well, now that he's not there, well, what, what's transition? Who's, who's running transition? What does that actually mean? Remind us, well, I think you alluded to a little bit about what he was like as a player. What do you believe his coaching legacy will be? There's four years of turning a culture around for a start that was not great. Um, however you want to look at it, it was in disarray. And you now have all the players coming out and saying we're a very, very united group. So that, to me, is one thing that's occurred in that four-year period, if nothing else. Um, the other thing is, I think they were, they've all, to a person, to Nick Hockley, have said, what a wonderful job he's done. He's just been the right person to come in and turn the ship around. So the professionalism, the excellence, the work ethics, all those sort of things 
will be always residual marks wherever Justin's been, whether it was as a player or, or now as a coach. So there is a fantastic foundation, I think, on which to build, which unfortunately Justin doesn't get to do, but whoever comes in next has a wonderful platform on which to launch their coaching career, I would have thought. In terms of Pat Cummins, is this his first real test now as, as the captain? Look, it is a test. Um, I think, as Alison said, I think, you know, he, he, he speaks well. He's very erudite. Um, you know, he, he does have that potential to be a person who has statesman-like attributes. And, uh, but nonetheless, you know, one, um, he's still got to deliver on the field. That's his main job. He's got a captain aside. That's his, that's his second job, if you like. First, to stay in the team, you've got to perform, whether you're captain or not. And then you've got to actually lead the side on the field. So he's got some uh, interesting tests coming up in terms of a bit of this one-day cricket, then moving into Pakistan. Haven't been there for 25 years. Um, you know, very hard to, very hard for anybody to tour away these days anyway. It doesn't matter what the country. And so, you know, they're going to go there on the back of no preparation, at least in terms of uh, four-day cricket, and, and straight into a test match series. So that'll be, a, that'll be a very, very interesting test for him and how he works his way through that. But at the moment, you know, points to him. Um, Andrew McDonald goes over as, as interim coach. Um, you know, I think, uh, I don't know whether anybody follows Ted Lasso, but he might be one of the uh, outside candidates to uh, uh, put his name forward for the job. I'd be very interested to find out your views on how the whole concept of being a head coach of a national team, the, you know, the country's team, may have evolved over the years. Yes, well, I guess, you know, if you listen to Ian Chappell um, and possibly Warney and a few others, um, you know, there's one role for a coach and that's something to do with driving. But the game has changed from Ian Chappell's days. And, and I listened to Nick Hockley uh, talk about, you know, when he's talking about transition and evolution and, and how he was trying to phrase what that meant. And it was very, very unclear what that meant. But one of the things that he threw into the mix was, well, we're going to look at shared leadership. You know, we've got George Bailey in there, who's the chairman of selectors, and we, we you know, see him as acting as a bit of an assistant coach. And then, we, you know, we've got our, possibly our assistance with somebody maybe looking after long form cricket and short form cricket, um, you know, but we're not going to change structures and we're going to keep the same sort of uh, role as, as the head coach. So he was very unclear, but one of the things that is very clear to me in running um, or being involved in an international cricket team is that if there are too many voices, it, it creates incredible difficulties in communication. Uh, from Cricket Australia's point of view, one of the outcomes of this should be that if uh, the High Performance Centre has any ideas, then one of those is really to work out how we actually progress our coaches, how we identify them in the first place, how we travel them into their various career paths. Alison was watching, and Jim not so much, Alison was watching some of the women's cricket, um, with Australia and England playing their Ashes series. Now, Matthew Mott was another young player in, in our Queensland setup, but he's, he's a young coach. Um, who again was a good player, but has traveled the road of, of coaching in, in many ways. And I, I think, you know, when the Australian men's team talk about calm and collaborative, Matthew Mott presents exactly that picture. Just um, to, to sort of wrap up, so there's also a, a vacancy with England, of course, at the moment, now that Chris Silverwood has gone. Knowing Justin Langer as you do, obviously been a lot of conjecture could you see him being interested in coaching England at all I, I could I mean um, obviously he's just a passionate Australian um, just wears the bag of green on his heart wherever he can you know in 2001 just a very you know very quick story we sort of hadn't picked Langer through that um, series gone with Slater and Hayden and then Slater got ill and, and so we had to try and find a replacement for him for the last test match. And Justin was playing, we were playing down in Sussex, I think, and, and all Justin had to do was go out and score 20 runs. And he got a duck, I think, in the first over. And he, he was just totally um, silent on the way back in the bus. So sat down with him that, that night. And two things he said, you know, he said, um, you and Stephen have betrayed me. You know, he said, you know, I'd run through a brick wall for you guys. 
um, at any any opportunity. And he said, when you had your opportunity to pick me in the side ahead of uh, either Slater or Hayden, you didn't. So that was one. But the other more telling one was he said, you've ripped my heart out. You've absolutely ripped my heart out. Because my heart is about my passion for Australia, my passion for playing cricket, my passion for wearing the baggy green cap. And I probably won't ever play again. Uh, anyway, long story cut short, we cuddled and made up. Didn't quite kiss, but cuddled and made up. Picked him in the next game, he made 100, and, and his smile has, has, has never stopped. That said, um, I don't think it'd be the right time for him to do it because I think um, he, he, he'll be just mentally and physically worn down at the moment. And he needs breathing space. Uh, he needs to get away from it. Um, probably needs to do a couple of other things and and then reassess whether coaching is, you know, international career coaching is the career that he wants to still pursue or maybe there are other things in life to do because I just think there'll be a lot of opportunities for him or, you know, because of the person that he is. But having said that, he's a good friend of Andy Strauss. Uh, we, we coach or I coached him in uh, 98 at Middlesex um, and he's just a really well-known around that part of the, part of the, the region great friend in Nigel Ray who's you know so Saracen's manager um or owner um good friend of Gus Fraser you know so that there are a lot of things that might be used to kind of tug him in that direction but I you know I think he certainly he'd certainly be a really good choice there's no doubt about that whether he's ready to do it or not don't know but just to just to pin you down before we let you go who do you think Cricket Australia would be well versed to look at I'll finish on, off on a controversial note. Um, the New South Wales camp would like Trevor Bayliss. The Victorian camp would like Andrew McDonald. So it depends which power group wins. That's what we catch. John, it's been a real pleasure to speak to you and to hear your views. Thank you so much for joining us on Stumped. Hey, my pleasure, Alison. Sheru and Jim, good to see you. Well, that is it for this week's Stumped. Uh, more news, features and debate next week. But for now, my thanks to Jim Maxwell and Cherry Sharma. And of course, to you for listening. See you next time. Bye-bye. From the BBC World Service, in association with ABC and All India Radio, this is Stumped.